Okay, <clears throat> we want to welcome everyone, and of course we're not live. Uh, do have good news though on that. I've been telling everybody that I see to subscribe, and we went from two weeks ago having 37 subscribers to 94, so it is working, but we still need 900 more, uh, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, it's uh, we are... We are getting the, uh, the numbers up, so I'm glad of that. And then, when we do this, this, this is recorded, and Sarge and I are doing the re recording, so if you're watching it, we at least was able to get some of it done. If you don't ever see it, nobody will know but these people in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we we need we need <laughs> Igor to sh sh stick his head in here and say this episode is pre-recorded. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> go ahead, stick your. <laughs> and this episode is pre-recorded. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> if you have uh, your Bibles, let's go to First Thessalonians chapter five. And we are actually going to be looking at verses 4 through 11, but it's kind of a continuation beginning actually back up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I want to pick up with verse 1, and we'll read through verse 11 of chapter 5. Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction, or then destruction will come upon them suddenly, uh, like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, but the day would overtake you like a th that the day would overtake you like a thief, for you are all sons of light, and sons of day, and we are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this wonderful opportunity at the close of yet another day that you have in your providence granted to each of us to live up to this point, to be able to assemble as we are here this evening to contemplate, meditate, and study upon your word. We are so thankful, Father, for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as he is revealed unto the minds of the men who wrote the Bible, and in this case, the Apostle Paul, these great truths. We ask that you might be with us as we study, that we might learn the things of which that it is designed to teach us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart that's receptive. Watch over us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as you know, beginning, uh, when, you, when you look at the outline of First Thessalonians uh, as, as a whole, uh, in fact, let's just back up a minute and, and, and make sure we, you know, I, I guess sometimes I feel like I do overkill, but I really don't want to overkill. I just simply want to make sure that our minds stay connected. And, and the whole background of First Thessalonians is important to why Paul even wrote this epistle. Uh, as you know, he, he writes it because he was forced to leave Thessalonica uh, under duress, uh, meaning that he had been there and had the opportunity to preach to the people of that city only three Sabbaths at the synagogue. And persecution then ensued, and the persecution was very, very bad. And because of that persecution, Paul left in the night. But as he left, he left this fledgling church, this new congregation. Now, he was probably there longer than just the three weeks, uh, but I doubt he was there more than a month or so, you know, because of the fact that 
uh, and, and that is so unlike him because every place else he ever went, when he went to Corinth, he was there for 18 months. When he was at Ephesus, he was there for three years. You know, it takes a while to establish a church, and it takes a while to develop and mature the members. Uh, not that Paul was the one who was developing and maturing. He was being used as an instrument by the Holy Spirit to do that as he administered the Word. And, and keep in mind, when he left, he didn't leave them with the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. It was being written. You know, I mean, he was writing these letters as there was needs uh, for it to be there. When he went in, like all the rest of the apostles, and he began to preach, mm -hmm. he was always preaching from the basis of the Old Testament because basically the focus of their teaching was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so everyone in the synagogues knew that there was coming a Messiah. And the big question that everyone had that was Jewish was, who is this Messiah? And so Paul would reason from the Old Testament scriptures by showing here's what the Messiah will be like, here's what the Messiah will do, and then bringing that and saying this is exactly what Jesus did. So the Messiah has come, and you need to receive him. And um, we find that uh, they would. There was always a handful. Remember, there's always the remnant. And if you want to illustrate the, the remnant of Israel, I always do it this way. I did it last night up at Summit on the board. Just draw a big circle and let that big circle be Israel. Then within that circle, draw a smaller circle. That's the remnant. That's the true Israel. Those are the people who God saved. Those out here are Hebrews because of genetic descent, you know, they, but they were not children of God. That's what Paul was saying over in Romans 9 when he says they are not all children of God who are the descendants of Abraham. You know, that was not the criteria. The criteria for being a child of God is faith. And the true descendants of Abraham are people of faith, Jew or Gentile, not due to bloodline. But anyway, they are the ones that usually grew very hostile. They're not the remnant, but the other. So the remnant's being called out. Come out from among her and be ye separate, Paul said at the church at Corinth. And so he would call them out. That would form the core of the church. Then he would move to the Gentiles. And then he would begin to preach to them. And he usually got his start with them also in the synagogues because keep in mind that there's usually some proselytes, meaning Gentiles who had identified with Israel. But the biggest bulk of it in these places were what we would call the God-fearers. Remember when we talked about those in the book of Acts? These are the Gentile people who never really were proselyted to Israel, but they believed in the God Israel spoke of. So they associated themselves with the Jews in the synagogue worship. And, uh, you know, so they, they but they, they didn't really become Jewish per se. And then those would obey. And then, of course, they would talk to their family and then it would just grow and you'd get a pretty good sized congregation before it was all over in, in these cities. But the unsaved Jews they always wanted to shut Paul down, or whoever. It didn't have to just be Paul. We just happened to know all Paul's writings. And so they would persecute. And uh, so that, that got really bad in Thessalonica. And because it got really bad, what we find is Paul left in the night, so he had not had a lot of time to establish them, didn't even get to leave them much of the Scripture. But now, if you've been there four or five weeks and you teach day and night, as was his custom, you can cover a lot of ground. And you can tell by this, the things he says, you have no need to be taught this or that. You know, he said that several times in First Thessalonians. And the reason he says that is because he covered it when he was there. But he's having to remind them. But there was other things he didn't get to. And, uh, and, but he hit, hit all the basics and hit it very well. And so that's, that's what happened. But now after he's gone, we find over uh, in about chapter 3, he can't stand not knowing what's happened to him. He's trying to figure out, are they still, are they still going strong? You know, are they still uh, being faithful? And you would wonder that. There was no cell phones. Uh, there was no, I mean, writing a letter required you to send it not by the post office, but by the hands of someone who had to make the trip. So, you know, it wasn't like he was going to, to know very quickly. So he's been gone a while. 
and he's he's concerned. Uh, when I left, persecution was at a peak. Even I had to leave. And so he's wondering, did they fold? Did they all go to jail? Were they all killed? Uh, did they all go back to Judaism? You know, I, I don't know what's happened. So more or less, he says in First Thessalonians 3, when I could stand it no longer, you know, I reached a point I couldn't, couldn't take it. It was worrying me. Uh, you know, I was just almost sick over it. So he sent Timothy. Timothy's gone and spent some time with them. I'm sure Timothy was preaching to them as well. Timothy has now come back, and he's given Paul his report. And he has said to Paul, this is uh, what I found. And so Paul is just beside himself. They're doing great. In fact, one of the noting, noted uh, comments about the church at Thessalonica, unlike almost any of the others, is we're dealing with a model church here. We're dealing with a congregation, unlike Corinth, where Paul you know, bragged on them for their faith, but still had to correct them had to get on them for their carnality on one occasion, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He makes the comment, if you remember, uh, I have much more to tell you, but you all are not even able to bear it. You know, I, I can't even go into it because you don't have the ability to understand it. You're carnal. You're still children, and you haven't grown much. He doesn't say that about Thessalonica. In fact, in, 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 this, in this epistle, he doesn't correct anything they're doing. He basically just keeps saying, you're doing great, but do do greater. You're doing good, but be gooder <laughs> if there is such a word. You know, you, you just keep on excelling. Keep on growing. Keep on developing. Keep on maturing. Because remember, perfection will never be reached in this lifetime and in this flesh, but it is always the goal. And so we just get better and better and better and better and better. I remember seeing years and years ago a little ad about two competing dairy farms. And one of, one of the people said, drink our milk, it comes from contented cows. And the, the competing farm uh, across the county said, drink our milk, our cows are never contented. They're always trying to do better. <laughs> you know, and and that's that's kind of the way we need to be as Christians, never become content and rest on our laurels, but try to continue to do better. So when you look at the outline of it, uh, chapter one, he just commends them for all the things they're doing. Chapter uh, two, he, he continues along that line and discusses his ministry with them. You know, even though I wasn't there long, you remember how it was that I labored and what it was that I said. Chapter 3, he tells us, basically, here's why I wrote to you and why Timothy came to you and why, why I'm writing to you now. And, and, and so really, the first three chapters are just introductory matters. Then he gets to chapter 4. And so when he gets to chapter 4... He uh, begins now teaching them about what every Christian needs to hold as one of the supreme theological doctrines, and that's the doctrine of sanctification, of growth. That's one of the most important doctrines to people who are already Christians, how we grow in Christ-likeness to the glory of God and to the praise of his grace. You know, that's, that, that's our objective. Mm -hmm become more and more Christ-like. So one of the big burning issues of that day in sanctification was the problem that they had with sexual immorality all throughout their cities, always a, a current threat, so to speak. And so Paul talks about their sanctification, the importance of it, and he zeroes in as his example of that is how they need to separate themselves from the sexually immoral practices that they once lived by. Then he gets to verse 13 of chapter 4. And when he gets to verse 13, he starts dealing with something that they weren't quite clear about. Now, they had been taught about the return of Christ. If you'll notice over in verse 10 of chapter 1, he was bragging on them for their faithfulness. And he says, And you all wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us 
from the wrath to come. So they knew about Jesus coming. While he was there, he had taught them. The, the same Jesus who ascends into heaven, just like the apostles in Acts 1 were taught, will also be coming back and descending just as he went up at a future date. And when he does, he's going to rescue his people, uh, snatch them up, uh, rapture them, uh, from the wrath which God will pour out then on the unbelievers. Now, the reason he brings this up, they knew that. They, they understood all that. They were waiting. They knew that until the end, we just sat back. You'll be coming. Some of them, I think, got confused, thought he was coming soon. You know, like tomorrow and so forth. But, but they knew he was coming. But then as they sat there, they noticed that their brothers and sisters were dying. I mean, in, in any congregation, any family, there's people who die all the time, right? And they go on before us. And then I'm sure that there were probably some who were in the process of dying. That is, that they are sick. And they know that their days are not going to be very long. And so they began to reason within themselves. Apparently he hadn't covered this. <laughs> okay. What about those who are already dead? What if I die before he comes? Uh, how can he rescue me if I'm not here? You know, I mean, how's that How's that going to go down? What about Grandma? She died last week. And so has she missed it? And, and so Paul picks up with that in chapter 13. And he says, no, nobody's missed it. Whether you're asleep or whether you're alive, you're going to be caught up. And see, and that's where you catch that concept of what we call the rapture. You know, a lot of my brethren erroneously have said the rapture is not taught in the Bible, and if you mean that very word, no, it's not. But the concept of the rapture is there. The word rapture literally means to snatch up, to jerk up, to, to rescue. You know, there are a lot of synonyms there. Now, what is wrong is the idea of, you know, when you get into dispensationalism and some of the the, the millennialisms, uh, there's all these theories about what's going to happen uh, and you're raptured, brought back, or you're not raptured and you suffer the wrath with those who suffer. I mean, you know, there's a lot of rivers that flow off, or streams that flow off of that river. Uh, but, but in a nutshell, it, it, it appears this way to me, that what the Apostle Paul is basically saying is that at the end, Jesus is, is coming and he's going to gather together and snatch them up off of this world, all of the, the people who have died, as well as those who are alive. Now, the dead will be coming with him, and you say, well, then how's he going to get them back in the world? They're going to reunite with their bodies. There's a resurrection, and they're going to have a body that is made of the substance of, of this earth, and uh, it won't be the same body that was planted, 1 Corinthians 15 says, but it is of the same substance, I believe, and uh, in some form or fashion. And uh, those souls will reunite with that, and then we are here, and then once that resurrection occurs, the resurrected ones go before us, then we follow after them, and there we will be in the, in, in the air uh, to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. Then we entered into chapter 5. And when we get into chapter 5, he switches gears and talks about the wrath. He says, there's where he said, Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord <coughs> will come like a thief in the night. Key phrase there being the day of the Lord. That is a term that is used always in the Old Testament uh, terminology of a day of judgment. So he's talking here about the wrath of God. Now, we're not a part of that because we've been, what, snatched away. But the wicked who are here will be a part of everything that's going on in that chaotic day when the heavens melt with forever and heat and the earth begins to burn up, even the elements thereof and earthquakes and everything begins to disintegrate. So you can imagine what that would be like uh, to be here during that process. And he says, and when that day comes, it's going to come like a thief in the night. That is, they're not going to be expecting it. Uh, he says, uh, you know, they'll be thinking everything is all right. It's kind of like it was in the days of Noah. Uh, when they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage and, and working. And then 
the Lord comes. And it's going to be a, a sudden destruction, just like a woman who is expecting a child. And the labor pains all of a sudden just start. And so that's where he has taken us up so far to the point of verse 4. But he's still on the subject. This subject flows out of that subject. So we've been dealing with the second coming of Jesus, and that began in verse 13 in chapter 4, and continues all the way down to verse 11. And now he looks at it from the perspective of what we might call night people and day people. I mean, he basically uses that term. He talks about sons of light, sons of day and how that we are not of the darkness as are others. So I guess we could say children of light versus the children of darkness. And it's interesting to note that uh, temperamentally, you know, we, we understand that even when we're not talking about spiritual things, right? You know how when we had our lessons on finding joy, even in the midst of all the conflict that we see happening in the world, that all of us have a temperament that God gave us. Some people are a little more pessimistic than others. Other people are really positive. Some people are very impulsive and out there. Other people are more subdued. Nothing wrong with any of that, you know, simply because of the fact that, that God made a variety of people to appeal to a, a lot of variety of people. Uh, but temperamentally, we know that there are some people who we call night owls, right? Not necessarily in a negative way, but that they do their best work late at night. Uh, my wife is one. Uh, you know, she, she gets her energy about 10, 30, or 11 o'clock. You know, that's when you'll find her cleaning something or working on a project. Now, me, I'm dead at 8. You know, I mean, there's no way... I could get up and start something like that. There's no way I could even write a lesson at something past uh, 8 o'clock in the evening because I like to be up early in the morning and have my coffee, and that be my first thing that I work on. And so when I put my lessons together and when I do my study and devotion, that's always between 8 and about 1 in the afternoon. And then about 1, I can, I can actually feel it in my body starting to to wane. You know, I go and take a walk and then I go and run the errands and then by the time I get back at two or three, I'm ready to sit down and take a nap and then come to a Bible study somewhere. And then when this is over, home and supper and bed, you know, I mean, I don't go straight. I get in a chair. It's a bed, I guess, and kick back and, and sleep that way. But, but uh, you know, <laughs> So you have those who are the night owls, and that's the people who like to work and stay up late uh, into the night, and the day people are just exactly the opposite. But here, Paul's not talking about that in a physical sense. He's talking about this in a spiritual sense. And there's a big difference spiritually between these two. Uh, the in entire human race and I always like the way that God has this ability to do that with all the variety and all the variations that we see in the world among people God can somehow reduce us down to one of two groups in most instances characterize us that way saved or lost members of the kingdom not members of the kingdom in Christ out of Christ and here he says you're either a night person or a day person <laughs> when it comes to your spiritual condition he's got it. so everybody is either a day person or a night person when it comes to the spiritual uh, uh, disposition that we have and that's what Paul is going to show us and as he does so he uses the term night people to, uh, uh, and he associates them with uh, darkness. He associates them with sleep. He associates them with drunkenness. Okay? Now, again, we're applying this spiritually. They're spiritually uh, in the dark, which means they cannot see. They're, they're spiritually asleep. They're unaware of what's happening. You can see that in the way he says that the day of wrath is going to come, right? It comes like a thief in the night. 
It's not because there's not signs and truths that tell us it could come at any minute. They're just unaware of it. You know, they're just not paying attention. They're asleep. They, they can't see it. They don't believe it. And then, of course, drunkenness, which I think he uses that particular sin uh, as a... Uh, as just in a metaphorical way, as kind of a synonym for all sins. Because when you really stop and you think about it, when does most sinning take place? Dark and night. I mean, you know, drunkenness. You know, most people I know that have been drunks, uh, now unless you're an alcoholic who get up too early in the morning and you start, you know, in the sense that you're just... Uh, you know, going to drink. But but for most people who are are the partiers, when do they begin? They they got to go work. They got to come home, and, and and some of them start. You know, they they go to happy hour. That's when it begins, and then drink until they just can't hardly get home anymore. Or some might not do it Monday through Thursday, but come Friday and Saturday and Sunday, they're going to be there doing it. But they do it at night. It's just like the bars here in this town. You know, right now, we don't hear anything coming out of them. But before you leave, uh, I don't think they do much on Monday through Thursday. But before you leave, you're going to hear it, you know, on Friday. We all do. We can hear the music. We can hear the motorcycle starting up. We can hear the, the laughter and everything from the one that's over on the street next to us. And it's always at night. It's not there when we come in here. It's always as we are leaving. So he's just saying this is the, the characteristic of these people spiritually. The day people, on the other hand, spiritually are, are enlightened. They walk knowing where they're going. They see. They have understanding. They are alert to their circumstances and what's going on round about them. And instead of being drunken, they're sober, serious. They realize that this is, this is something that's coming. This is something that's going to happen, and we need to be ready. It's just a very, very simple way in which God uh, shows us the distinction between believers and non-believers, okay? Uh, between believers and non-believers. The people who have received salvation now walk in the light. They've been given light. They've been given life, so they're alert. People who have not been saved, they remain in darkness and are still in a stupor. And so Paul is writing here all of this for encouragement. Did you catch that? This was nothing to make the Thessalonians afraid. Look at how he ended chapter 4, verse 18. Therefore what? Comfort one another with these words. Your rapture. You're being caught up. You're being snatched up when the Lord comes off of this planet. That's not nothing to fear. That's something to look forward to. And, and, and knowing your loved ones will be raised to and in that that are saved, that's a comforting thought. Nobody's left out uh, among the saved. Then after he discusses the, the, this in chapter 5, look at how he ends that, this section in verse 11. Therefore what? Comfort, each other. Comfort one another, encourage one another, and build up one another, just as you also are doing. So he didn't write this to the Thessalonians to burden them or to cause them anxiety. It was written to, to actually release the anxiety, to calm them down so that they might have some understanding. So... As far as we are concerned, what we saw back in verse uh, or in chapter four, the last thing for us in this physical realm, okay, the very last event for you in this physical realm uh, in God's timetable is our rapture. Okay, we're going to be caught up. You know, a lot of people think, "Oh, my death's my last thing." No, it ain't. You're not done. Okay, your soul goes to be with God and there rest until when? Until the resurrection comes. Then he's going to raise your body. You'll be back here. Then you'll enter that body and then you'll be caught up. That's your last event. Okay, as far as earth time is concerned. Uh, we, you know, he's going to descend as we saw with a shout. He will shout, a shout that raises the dead because he is the power that raises the dead. The same shout that he gave when he said, Lazarus, come forth. 
He will say that in a general sense so that every person who has ever lived, whose molecules of their body are distributed here in this planet somewhere in the dust of the ground, will reassemble themselves <laughs> into a resurrection body. What a picture. You know, isn't that, isn't that some Everybody, he's an atom. Eve, you know, their 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 molecules are out there somewhere, aren't they? You know, we we are a closed system in the sense that there's no new matter being made. We're only rearranging matter. Okay, you understand that? That you know, God isn't adding new molecules. It's the same molecules that were all here when it first began. They've just now been rearranged. All our molecules of this body are now in the shape of this body. What happens to it, though, when you die? Well, it goes back to the dust of whence it came. It's going to decompose. It's going to break down. And then, you know, if you are not embalmed and put placed in a vault, and if we just left you laying or put you in the ground, you know, in a 200 years we dig you up, we're not even going to find bone in most places. You know, you've just gone back into the, the very dirt from which you came. It's all those same elements. So God will do that. He, he, he even does that with bodies that are lost. You know, because when you talk about, say, somebody dies in a fire or an explosion and there's nothing left, you, you know what I'm saying? It's just, you know, they talked about how that when 9-11 uh, at the towers in New York City, that that dirt, that dust, that soot, was when analyzed, filled with human DNA. Of course, it would have been, right? But, you know, there's no body there. I mean, it's just, just like ashes uh, because of the incineration that took place. But, hey, don't think those people are gone somewhere in the sense that they no longer exist. Those people are, uh, you know, their souls, if they're saved, are with Christ. And if they're not, there were the rich man and Lazarus, uh, or where the rich man was in the story of the rich man and Lazarus, but their bodies will be reconstituted. Now, the scriptures teach that when he says, and, and uh, death and hell gave up the dead within them, and the sea gave up the dead. That's, that's a metaphor for talking about bodies that have been lost. Because what do they always call you when somebody's out in the ocean and they can never find you? They call you what? Lost at what? Lost at sea. So that's just a metaphor for saying people whose bodies are lost. Listen, you've got a great God. He ain't lost nobody. And so when Christ says, come forth, that happens how fast? In a twinkling of an eye, all of this matter starts to reassemble itself into this glorious resurrection body, this spiritual body, okay, that you will have forever and forever. If you're still here, you'll be changed into a spiritual body in that twinkling of an eye. So, you know, nothing nothing is, is gone. And that all comes starting with the shout of the Lord. And then the archangel's going to shout. Okay? And then a trumpet is going to sound. And the saints are all going to rise and, uh, from the grave. And they'll be joined with their spirits. And those who are alive will all be changed. And then everybody is raptured of that group that is caught up. And that's why he ends chapter 4 with that comfort, therefore, one another with these words. Now, keep in mind, Paul's intent here in this section is not to teach a theology, though it is theology, okay? You know, one of the things about a systematic theology, the way that works is you find a doctrine and then you begin to explore the scripture everywhere where that doctrine is. And in many places, that doctrine then will be developed, you know, uh, unpacked. When you look at the book of Romans, Paul took 16 chapters to unpack the doctrine of justification by faith. 16 chapters. That's what the book of Romans does. It impacts, that's a very highly theological document, okay? Uh, he doesn't unpack everything here. In fact, you won't see that. You want to know all the details of how this leads down to this? Go to Revelation. 
you know, go, the, the, there you get the details of the epics and the times and, and how this all plays out. But if you'll notice, Revelation is picking you up in John's day and hurling you through the times to what? To what we just read about right here. See, we're on that rocket right now blasting through the years and the centuries and and we are headed all to that destination isn't it a shame that there are those who have no clue where this is going you know some think it's all going to be recycled some people think well there's just no definitive end it's just going to end and be no more but then there's us We've been given knowledge. But Paul is not here in this section going to give the Thessalonians all these details. He basically is writing so that he can encourage them. They were troubled. <clears throat> People are troubled today about the end of time, aren't they? Yes, very much. And I'm not talking about just the unbelievers. I know a lot of Christians who, you know, out of their mouth proceed such things as, well, you know, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go right now. That's one of the most stupid statements that a human has ever uttered. Uh, but, it, it, you know, and I, I, it shows a lack of understanding. Maybe I should say ignorant, not stupid. I don't know. They're supposed to know. So maybe they are stupid. Uh, you know, read where we're headed. You know, read where you're headed. And the way that that's going to be who would say, I don't want to go there right now. I would rather stay here where I can watch the news every night and become suicidal at all the things that are going on. So I can sit and worry about what the tests the doctors did last week are going to reveal about me or how I'm going to make all the ends meet uh, as recession continues. You know, I mean, how, how is this going to, how is this going to, uh, why would you want this over that? Except I think it comes from a lack of faith on the part of the believer. Very much. And I think what hinders the believer mm -hmm. is many cannot relinquish their salvation totally to Jesus. They want to continue to hold on to how this has to have something to do with me. I'm contributing something. And, 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 but, but when you take that view, are you ever comfortable with what you're contributing? No. <laughs> well, no wonder you don't want to go because you ain't sure, are you? <laughs> okay. Not enough, yes. <laughs> that's right. That's what I'm saying. We haven't, haven't done enough. And, and so you can see where the problem lies. Uh, but Paul is not trying to trouble these people. He's comforting them. He's being pastoral. You know, I, I know the brethren I've grown up with hated that word pastor. I don't know why, uh, but it is a term that is used in scriptures from the Greek word pomian, which means to feed and shepherd. And church leaders are pastors in the sense that elders what? <clears throat> feed and shepherds. Preachers what? Feed and shepherd the flock. And by feeding, we mean we preach. And by shepherding, we mean we help them deal with the issues that they face in their life. These people were anxious, not only about the rapture, but about the day of the Lord. They're concerned about divine judgment. You know, I, I don't want to receive that either. They know it's going to be very severe. They know it's going to be cataclysmic. They know it's a day of wrath. He said that over in verse 9 even though he's told them you will be rescued from it. And what it is is that when, that, when, when Jesus shouts, man's day, man's reign is done, and the day of the Lord has begun. And it's always a day of judgment. It starts with fire and destruction. And it's imaged by the destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, there's a microcosm of it on the cross. In a microcosm, I mean a small picture. Because at noon on that day, Jesus had those six hours that Friday. He hung suspended between heaven and earth. And if you remember, there was, uh, I think, what, six or seven things, that sayings that took place. And uh, he, uh, 
in the, the, the first three hours, uh, he had a conversation with the, the people or the thieves, the thieves on the cross. He told John what to do, if you remember, with, uh, with his mother. But then at noon, everything changed. God shows up. The Father shows up. And he doesn't show up to rescue his son. He shows up to pour his wrath out upon his son. And one of the first things that happened was darkness covered Sky the earth. Dark, yeah. And we're not talking about a cloud. We're talking about pitch night. Black, yeah. Pitch black. The earth then began to what? Shake and quake. And the graves in the city were opened. And they rose. And Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Feel that pain. That's the wrath. That everyone who is outside of him will experience on that day. So there was a very beautiful picture of it in a very small way. And there you see our Savior standing and taking it for us. That's why you don't have to. And so everybody who is worried about that, who is a believer, is insulting the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I know you took all of that that day on the cross, but I don't think that was enough. That's a sin. Yes, that's right. That's why I say be, we need to beware that we do not demean him. But anyway, but all of the details of it is is detailed for us in the book of Revelation. But here the Thessalonians are concerned about two things. The believers who are already dead, as we mentioned, have they missed it? And also what happens if I die before he comes? And so in verses 13 through 18... Uh, Paul basically says, listen, the dead are included in the rapture. Glorified spirits with glorified bodies will all be changed. We'll all be with Christ forever. Now, if you're a child of God, you are not in the day of the Lord. You're not going to be in that judgment. That's a judgment of wrath, isn't it? And if you've been saved from that, that's not for you. It's not for believers. And, and, and that's the second thing they're concerned about. Should I be afraid? Should I fear the day of judgment? Not if you're saved. If you're saved, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, is not for you. It's a day of wrath upon who? The, the unbeliever. Don't you fear it? You don't want to be cowering when he comes in the closet somewhere. You, know, you want to be going what? Here, take me, take me, take me now. That's, that's what we want. And uh, so Paul is trying to, to let them know, don't worry about this. And so the point uh, uh, of this is to provide comfort, encouragement, to build one another up with reminding each other of it, uh, cheer one another on, and let you know your future is secure. The rapture is for the children of the light and the day of judgment is for the children of the night of the darkness so let me give you just some contrasting concepts between the believer and the unbeliever the unbeliever has salvation the i mean the believer has salvation the unbeliever has wrath we have life they have death we have hope they have no hope. We live in the day. They live in the night. We walk in the light, and they walk in the darkness. Hell, Debbie. And we are awake, and they are asleep. We are sober, and they are drunk. And uh, they, 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 we will be with the Lord forever, and they will be separated. Debbie, you've not missed much. I'm still in my introduction for the first time. <laughs> so we've just had an hour of introduction. 
<laughs> so, so, so you haven't you we haven't gotten to the text yet, but it's First Thessalonians chapter five. Sam, while you're, while you're on that break uh, there, go ahead. Can you repeat those again, the believer and unbeliever? Okay, yeah. Salvation versus wrath. Uh, the believer has salvation. Life versus death. Hope versus no hope. Day versus night. Dar uh, light versus darkness. Being awake versus being asleep. Sober versus drunkenness. Being with the Lord forever or separated from the Lord forever. There's your basic distinctions between the two groups. So, really, what I said earlier, there's only two kinds of people. Uh, people of the night or people of the day. You can't miss that point, what Paul says. That's it. So, in the light or in the dark? Night, overnight. Right. So, does the term uh, coming as a thief in the night, does that apply to those who are saved? Mm -hmm. Only in the sense I don't know the moment, but is is he going to catch you unaware? If 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 his trump, right? That's, that's 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 what I think the beauty of this is. We know he's coming. Uh, and right, and, and so while we're not privy to the hour or the day, if if he sounded right now, I'm not going to be caught off guard. I'm going to say, oh, it's here. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it, 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 it's happened. But see, these other people, the people of the night, it's like, well, I didn't even know there's a thief outside. Mm -hmm. You know, it comes as a thief in the night. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. hmm. He also um, gives us indications of whether it's close. Yes, time, times and seasons. Yeah, yeah. We, You know, Jesus even told those people who were in, involved, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem was also a microcosm of judgment, God's judgment on Israel. They came in and they killed millions and the Romans did and razzed the city and tore down the temple, you know, I mean, all of that, A.D. 70. Well, when Jesus was talking about it coming, he says, when you see, he gave all kinds of signs. He said, uh, he, he said now you know, when trees bud, summer is nigh. You know, even though it's been cold the last four or five days here, and I wish to hear him get warm. I know that what? The warm weather's just around the corner. It's coming. Why? All the signs are here. Okay? I don't know what day it's going to arrive and stop and, and, and stay. And, and then we'll finally be saying, don't you wish it was back like it was in the spring when it was cold? <laughs> <laughs> but, but for the most part, we've seen the signs. The trees are leaved out. The flowers are blooming. The sun is shining. Uh, we get a little warmth in the afternoon, and so we say the signs are all here. So one day we're going to wake up, and we're going to see the temperature rise up into the 70s, and there she'll stay, and maybe even get much warmer as we proceed down through toward next winter. So, But we see the signs. Many times, though, if you uh, make a comment in that regard to people, they will brush it off and say, well, now he's coming as a thief in the night. Yeah. You don't know when. Yeah, no, I don't know when as to the day and the hour, just like those people did. But but listen, Jesus gave those people in that day, and this is interesting, Josephus supports this. He told them, he says, So when you see the abomination of desolation set up, and he was speaking of what actually transpired in history. Titus leads the army in. They surround the city, but before they attack, something happens, and Titus takes a trip, and so they just camp outside the city. And Jesus said, flee. Flee to the mountains, which is backwards of what people did when under attack and siege. You fled to the city and closed the gates. But Jesus said, flee to the mountains and pray your, pray your flight will not come in the winter. Pray that you're not nursing a child. 
you know, he says, but this is what you do. Well, Josephus says not a Christian lost their life in that time. Because when they saw that and that little respite that took place between Titus doing whatever he was doing and coming back, the Christians all fled the city. So they knew. Mm -hmm. And they knew the signs. And they got out of town and survived it. Whereas the... Right, right, yeah, just a microcosm of what's what's coming. So see, we, 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 uh, uh, you know, I, that thief in the night means just totally unexpected, unexpected. You don't even know there's, a, you don't believe there's a thief there, you know, and he just shows. Because if there was a thief there, Jesus' own words was what? You'd be ready. You may not know exactly when the thief's coming, but you're ready for the thief, right? So I don't know the exact day and hour that Jesus is coming, but I tell you what, I, I, I'm not going to be surprised. It's not going to be sudden destruction on me. Uh, you know, it's, and, and Jesus even told us, watch and pray. For you don't know what hour the Son of Man cometh. So, you know, watch for what? Well, we can see. We know. I mean, there are signs that are there. So you're right. People th tend to think that we, we, we just live aimlessly and have no clue. No, we got a lot of clue. And, and when you look at the book of Revelation, it gets even more specific mm -hmm. as to some things. You know, I, I know that Revelation sets these parameters. Revelation says when John uh, is told by the Lord, he says, I'm going to show you things which were and are and are to come will come. So from John's day, there were some things already passed, seven churches. Then he says, and then there's the things that are. That's also the seven churches because they both deal with that. Then in chapter four, that's the first three chapters. Chapter four, John's called up into heaven and open door is before him and a voice says, come up and see what shall be hereafter. So now the future begins for John. And the first vision he seen is the throne. God's sovereignty, his rule over all the earth. And in his hand is, is the future. Why? In whose hand is the future? Who has ordained and written in his book all things that will conspire? Okay, and it's in there. And so he was, John was just waiting for somebody to open it so I can look in it and see what's there. And then very dramatically, God points out that they look and they can't find anybody. They look through heaven and earth and they can't find him. And John says, I wept, disappointed, grieved. And then one of the angels comes next to John and he says, weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> and John turns and he says, and I saw a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. There he is. And he marches to the throne and the father hands him the scroll. And he begins to peel back the seals. Mm -hmm. And as he does, a voice says, come John and see. And so John begins to write. So you have the seven, seven uh, seals which deal with the fall of the first enemy of the church, Satan working through paganism. Then you have the seven trumpets dealing with the fall of the great Roman Empire, which was the great enemy of the church physically. So you had spiritual and you had the physical. Then you have the seven vials, which brings about the end of time. Oh, no, no, we're, you know, I mean, it's like I say, in my understanding, vial six is done poured out, seventh vial's poured out now, I think poured out in the air and we're just waiting for the ramifications of all of that to settle so no I'm not surprised at all <laughs> you know I'm not surprised at all I think it's it's uh, you know we're, we're living in the shadow of his return and that shadow is, 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 is getting fainter and fainter because now it's becoming the body the substance you know the shadow disappears when the body arrives you know, you, I might see your shadow around the corner of this, this thing, but once you step into the room, I'm not seeing the shadow no more. I'm seeing you. And that's what I think is, is happening. So, no, 
uh, I think that that's referring that that all of that terminology here is in this section on the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord specifically targets the unbeliever, and uh, that's that's that that's what I think, for whatever that's worth, <laughs> you know. But but that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Uh, oh, I know it. Right, right. I know. It's the ignorance in the church is is saddening. You know that goes back to what Paul told the church of Corinth. He said, "I have so much to teach you, but you're not able to bear it." And you know, I and, and I run into that situation. There have been places I've gone where I wanted to share some of this from the pulpit, but just talking to the people I knew there was no way. I might as well have got up there and spoken French or something that none of them has ever studied. Because they don't study. And then 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 they don't they don't have <laughs> Now see we wasn't ready for that. <laughs> If I'd have known Donna, though, hadn't turned her phone off, I would have been ready for it. <laughs> we both turned our phones off. Watch, Sarge will be, Sarge will be saying that. He'll be like this one guy. I remember where was I at. I was somewhere, and there was this guy. I'm sitting here looking for my phone, and I'm being recorded. Uh, I'm sitting here going, where did I put my phone? And, and, anyway, I got tickled. There was this guy who was doing this lecture one time. And he was telling everybody, and he said, and there's one thing that he says, I will not tolerate in here. And he said, that is your cell phones going off. Turn everybody phone turn them off. So we was all turning. This is when I was going to a school thing. About 15 minutes into his talk, his rings. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed because he had to, he said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that he had been so hard against, you know, telling us all of those things. But, but you know, you can't help it. We forget to do things. Like I said, I'm sitting here looking for my phone, and I'm looking into my phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so well, that... That's case of being seen <laughs> Yeah, it is. But anyway... This learning has made Sam mad. Here's the thing. As believers, you don't have anything to fear about the future. You're in his hand. And, and, and what did he say? Listen, let, let me show you his promises. These are promises nobody talks about either. I don't know why they don't talk about them. I mean, you know, we got our little pet sermons, you know, uh, and, and the little pet sermons, we got 10 or 12 of them, just change the title and preach them again. And everybody will think it's great. But, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible is, is just so wonderful in, in, in what it teaches us about the confidence that that we that we should have, and um, the apostle Paul tells us over in the book of Romans. I can't find the verse right offhand, but he says that we are really more than conquerors in Him. Okay, mm -hmm. who can can separate us from the love that God? has for us. Romans 8. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. Verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? There's the question, who? Well, let's see. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? Just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Notice, do you notice everything he says we have falls back on him? Never on us. For I am convinced. Persuaded. Persuaded. That's a strong word in the Greek. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We have no reason to fear the future. Unless you look at this list and say... 
Yeah, but, uh, you know. And most people do that. They look at that list and say, yeah, but I might not be, be good enough. So you're stronger than all those things. You have power that those things don't have. He said, any created thing. Last time I looked, I'm what? Created. So even my flaws are not sufficient to pull me away. Because it's not my grip on God that holds me. It is God's grip on me. Because I'm just not that strong. And that, that, that's, that's our security. But anyway, as believers, we have nothing to fear. And uh, so he now is going to give us three reasons of why we don't have to fear in the text. Okay. He's going to give us three headings. All right. The first one is we don't have to fear the future in this day of wrath because of our nature. Our nature. Look at what he says in verse 4. But you, brethren, that's a term of endearment, are not in what? darkness chapter 5 verse 4 that the day would oh see there I ends answer your question you are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief it's not going to overtake us like a thief so that phrase doesn't apply to us he says but you are sons of the light and sons of the day we're not of the night nor of the darkness so our nature is a new nature if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. New creature. Mm -hmm. You got a new nature. The, 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 the day of the Lord is going to come upon those with the old nature. That's never been, that's never been cleansed. Because what's our default position? Righteous or sinner? Sinner. We, when we come into the world, we come in sinners. Sinner. When we, we, we are then changed. Okay. And uh, so that's uh, that's what he's saying. We've got a new nature. We've got a, 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 a new heart. It's not going to, he says, overtake us as a thief in the night, uh, uh, like a thief in the night, because we're not of the night. We live in the light. We know it's coming. That's why he went ahead and said that the day would overtake us as such. We're not of that. We're not of the night. We're not of the darkness. We're not part of the wrath of God. Thus, no part in the day of life. And if you'll notice verse 3, those people that it comes upon, they're never going to escape. Peace and safety, then what comes on them? Destruction. Destruction. That's going to come on them. But here in verse 4 is where the contrast begins. The contrast between those who get hung up in the day of the, the Lord and those of us who don't. Here, uh, he tells us we're going to escape. And the reason we're going to escape, we're of a different family than the sons of men. Right? We've been born again and we're now in the family of God. The day of wrath is not for the family of God. The day of wrath is for those who are not of God's family. We, we're a different people. And this, this, this whole thing continues on down through verse uh, 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 7, the contrast does. Mm -hmm. We're not going to experience the wrath of God because we have a different nature, a new nature, and a new heart. We have been, how was it, what was it Jesus called it in John 3? We have been what? Born again. Born again. That's what he said. Yeah. Unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of heaven. So we are not in darkness. The night people are. That's why he told Cornelius. Right. The, the, the night people are the target of the wrath. Comes upon them as a thief, and it comes in the night of their darkness. They don't see it coming. Spiritual darkness characterized. I remember my granddaddy telling me a story when I was a kid. You know, he always told my great granddaddy. He used to tell me all kinds of stories. And I, loved them. I always remember when I was playing. We didn't sit and play computer games all day or watch TV. It wasn't nothing on. We played and 
every now and then I'd run in and I'd crawl. He was crippled with arthritis, and if he wasn't out on the farm, he was always laying in his bed, and I'd crawl in the bed and say, tell me a tale, Granddaddy. And I can remember one he told, he said that back before there were cars, and he said, uh, family all lived sometimes two or three miles apart, but they all lived on the same stretch of land, you know. And he said one night he was coming home from his uh, granddaddy's house, and he was headed over to his house, and he said, I would take a step or something would step behind me. He said, there wasn't roads. He said, you're just in the woods in a lane, and he said, you could hear it, and he said, I'd stop. He'd stop. He heard what? Well, that's what I was saying. He didn't know. He just he'd take a step, and then it would take a step. Oh, I know. I told you. We went that. <laughs> and he said he would go, and he said <laughs> he said he knew. Yeah, he said he was he knew something was happening. So see, in the darkness, he couldn't tell, <laughs> and he wasn't sure he's was even gonna hear anything. He said so. Finally, he just stopped, and he said he had an old flintlock gun. You know, the kind of poof, you have to let him pump the stuff back in. He said so. I just shot it in there. He said, it lit up, and he said, there was a mule. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the mule had followed me home. <laughs> but the point was, in the darkness, he couldn't see, no. unaware of what might be there. Uh, so we find that, that that's, that's the way the that's people... we run our hardest. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's the way that the darkness is. Unless you hate. <laughs> I can hate with the so it's going to come upon them as a thief, but spiritual darkness characterizes the very nature of unbelievers. There's, there's two types of spiritual darkness they live in. There's mental darkness and moral darkness. They just don't see. They, they can't see, their imaginations are vain, and they don't understand right and wrong. Okay? They, they just don't comprehend it. If you want to see mental and moral, go over to Ephesians and uh, look with me in Ephesians 4. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says to the church at Ephesus in verse 17. He says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, having uh, being darkened in their what? Understanding. So what did he say? Darkened in their understanding. understanding. Excluded from the life of God. See, they're dead because of what? ignorance that is in them they don't know because of the hardness of their hearts and they having become callous have given themselves over now here's the moral the first two verses deal with the mental here's the moral they've given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness but look at the contrast verse 20 the children of the day you did not learn Christ in this way Okay, see, even there he's teaching this difference, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So you see the mental and the moral darkness that envelops the people who are not Christians. Mm -hmm. Left to ourselves, man is in darkness, darkened in our minds to the truth, darkened by the pervasive blackness of, the, uh, of unrelieved wickedness. Sin clings to us. There is no good that dwells in the flesh. And if you're not a Christian, that's all you're in. You're not in the Spirit, so you have no good in you. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. There is none who do, does righteous, Paul says in Romans 3. There is none righteous, no, not one. So thus the darkened mind is cut off from the understanding of the truth. And the darkness of our conduct makes us rebels against God. But as we all know, the light's there. So the problem, is it with the message or the heart? Heart. The heart. I ask you a question. If I have no eyes with which to see, Is there ever going to be a bright enough light that I will comprehend it? Mm -mm. No. It's not going to happen. Because we have... You remember when Jesus says, if the eye is evil, mm -hmm. 
great is the darkness. What he was saying was, the problem you people are having in rejecting me as the Son of God is not because the proof is not before you. It's not, the problem is not in the light. The problem's in your eyes. And, and that, that, that's the thing with the sinner. The sinner does not see because there's a problem with the light. Okay? It's not that the message is unclear. It's not that Jesus is un incomprehensible. He's incomprehensible to them, not because of anything within him, but because of their love of sin. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And that's what has to be overcome. Light shines in darkness. John said in John 1 verse 5, but the light they did not comprehend. So the light was there, but they didn't understand it. The light came, but it was not received. And if you'll look in John, well, let's just go over there. I wasn't going to go there, but I want to go there now. Okay. Go to John chapter 1 and look at what he says in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not what? Comprehend, Comprehend it. Why? <laughs> If you will go over to Second, or, I mean, excuse me, go over to John chapter three. After in his conversation with Nicodemus, look at what he says in verse nineteen. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Because you, you, your will responds to the nature of your heart. Yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew who you meant. But, but uh, your will responds to what the heart feels. If the heart loves the darkness, then what will your deeds be? And verse 20 basically says that for everyone mm -hmm. who practices and evil hates the light. That, yep, there you go. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So there we have it. Well, you know, how does that overcome? Let me show you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You've got to teach people the truth, but it's got to be God who illuminates their heart. 2 Corinthians what? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen to this. Verse 3. Even And even if our gospel is veiled, it's hidden. It's hidden to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the, the uh, light of the, uh, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's the first thing. Christ has to be preached. There's where we come in. But that's not going to be enough, just me. He says, just as the Lord and ourselves as your bondservant, for God, now catch verse 6, who said light shall shine out of darkness. He takes us back to creation. Who said let there be light? God. Is the one. Who's the one? Break her down now. God. All right, God. What has God done? He is the one who did what? Shine out of darkness. Shine out of darkness to where? Shine our hearts to be the light of knowledge. <laughs> knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. God's call. God is the one, not Sammy. Now, I know you want to go somewhere with that. Don't. Why do Don't go there. He ain't answered <laughs> that question. Why doesn't he shine in everybody's hearts at the same time? Why in some hearts does he never shine? Who am I, old man, to question God? Yep. You know, I, I am not to say, you know, I, I'm just the clay. <laughs> you know, I'm just the clay. And, and I do whatever the potter says. However, I did hear of a preacher who made the comment. I didn't hear it, but a friend of mine did in his exposition on Romans 9 in order to get out from under God's control of all things, made the comment that, well, the clay can refuse
I'm so glad that this cup decided not to refuse. Because <laughs> then I wouldn't, mm -hmm. have, I wouldn't have had a nice glass. No, the fact is that this cup did whatever the metallurgist did with it. You know what I'm saying? Whatever machine that the... Anyway, I don't want to get into all that, but I just wanted you to see that. Uh, so Jesus referred to Satan in Luke 22. And, and look at what he says about him. I love it. And, and, and what he says is applicable to all of us as well. In Luke chapter 22... <laughs> And look at verse 53. He says, While I was with you daily in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this hour and the power of darkness are yours. So Satan had his time. And then Jesus also makes the comment that Satan is coming. This is in John. And he says, And he has nothing on me. Now let me tell you something. He ain't got nothing on you neither. Amen. Now you may be sitting there thinking, oh yes he does. <laughs> Don't he know everything I've ever done? Wasn't he the one that was pulling me into all that? Yes, but your life is now hid, is it not? In Christ, yes. There's the good. There's that hallelujah moment, guys. Hallelujah. Okay, so over there, and let me see if I can find that where, where Jesus says that. And uh, because you know, so time, so many times we know he had nothing on Jesus, but listen, because he had nothing on Jesus, and we're in Jesus, he now has nothing on what us. I mean, that's that's just a syllogistic reasoning, and that's why we don't have to be afraid. That's why we're children of uh, of light. Um, let me see if I can find it. See, I'm really lost without my phone because I can usually type in just that word and it'll give me the verse right then. But I'm not able to do that right now. It's because you're looking at your phone. I, I know it. That's true. I want to say it's John 12. I'm glad you reminded me of that because I'd start be over here looking for my Bible or looking for my phone <laughs> under my Bible. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I can't find it. He's, he, he just makes the comment that uh, he says he, he is coming, but he has nothing on me. Anyway, you know it. We studied it in John. And, and, number, and In number verse number 36. Of what? 35 in mm -hmm. John, where you were at, 12. Uh -huh. Is that where he says it? I think it says, These things Jesus spoke departed and was hidden from them, but though... No, maybe not. No, that's not it. Okay. I was getting ready to really brag on Sarge, but no, no I'm not going to. I'm no. <laughs> no, it's okay. Don't spend a lot of time on it. It's it's there. But let, let me show you where the Bible shows you why he has nothing on you either. Go to Colossians 3. Got to love it. Great verse. And I want you to... Now, now, you know, here's what we don't do. We just let people read us verses and, and we skim over them. I want you to listen to this. Okay. Colossians 3. And let's take it slowly. Let's pay attention to the verbs, okay? Colossians 3, verse 1. Therefore, and I'm going to fight the urge to take you through chapter 2. Three, verse chapter 3, verse 1. Okay. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ. Now, what he's referring to there is when we came to Christ, we were buried and raised. That is, this is a way of saying you got a new life. You become a new creature. You've been resurrected spiritually. Okay, when Christ raised, everybody that was his was raised in him. Okay? He says, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. So he's told you now that you are a new creature, use that new heart to seek things spiritual. Set your mind on the things above. No longer are you a part of this world. You're no longer in the darkness. You're now in the what? Light. The light. And then look at verse 3. For you have what? Died. died. You are no more. And your life is now what? In with Christ. So when Jesus, who is our life, is revealed, that is when he comes with that shout, we will be what? 
with him. Be with him. In glory. Wow, wow, wow. See? Same thing. All the way through. Satan had nothing on him. I'm in him. Satan has nothing on me. Embrace that forgiveness. <clears throat> you know, one thing, I, 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 I struggle with shame. I, I really do, and I don't think that'll ever be taken from me, and I'm kind of glad, because as long as I'm ashamed of the bad things I did, I'm going to stay away from them. You, you know what I'm saying? There, shame has a part, but I don't... I think that's a good thing, Sam. It is. That's our fail safe. All right. I no longer struggle with guilt. There's a difference. Okay? You know why I no longer struggle with guilt? Because he's declared me justified in Christ. So while if I let my mind go back to the shameful things I've done, oh, I feel embarrassed, I feel shame, but I don't run to him and say, will you please forgive me of that? Because I believe he already has. So I let it go. I don't struggle with the guilt. Uh, I hate the shame. I wish I hadn't done some of them things, you know. Uh, I'm not the only one in here that feels that way. Do I? <laughs> They're not things in your past that you, you look back and you just wish you could get amnesia and say, I sure wish that that had never happened, but we don't get a redo. Okay? Not on that. But, but God allows the shame to remain. But I don't feel guilty. And the reason I don't feel guilty is I know who, in whom I've believed. And I know when God declares something to be, it is. And when I came to his son in faith, he declared me to be justified, not guilty. So I'm what? Not guilty. So don't struggle with guilt, guys. Okay? That again shows a lack of faith. Doesn't mean you've lost your faith. It just means that you've misplaced it. Where is it? <laughs> Pull it back out. Embrace the shame. That'll keep you from doing it again. You know, uh, David said, my sin is forever before my face. Now, he didn't feel guilty about his sin forever. He just sure. knew that that was a shameful thing. He was never going to get away from, in his mind and in his heart, the time he let God down by his adultery and the murder of Uriah. David knew that. Mm -hmm. And that was always a source of, uh, of pain for him. But it's also probably kept him from ever doing it again, since the story shows us he never did do it again. <laughs> you know, he, he, he was that way. Anyway, this is some good stuff. Everything is good stuff. But that, that, that's, that, that's, that's where we are. So Satan, he's the one who oversees the domain of darkness. Okay? And the text says, we're not of this. Look at verse 4. You are not in darkness. You are not in darkness. You're not mentally impaired anymore. You're not morally impaired. And, and, and the reason is given in verse 5. For you are all what? Sons of light. Your nature's different now. You were born again. That doesn't mean that, that uh, uh, or what, he, he says we are sons of light. We're sons of the day. That's what he says in verse 5. Now, uh, that's a Hebraic expression uh, when you say the son of whatever. Mine says children. Okay, yeah. That's, they use the word son or children or uh, offspring sometimes. So it said, you know, so, so the Hebraic expression, you are sons of. You know, remember how they come out and they all said, well, we're the sons of Abraham. Abraham. Remember that? Mm -hmm. they, they like to use that. And let me tell you what it meant. It meant you are under the influence of whatever you say you're the son of or children of. So if I say I'm a son of, if I'm called the son of light, what's influencing my life? The light, who is Christ. He is the light of the world. So whatever it is that dominates your life characterizes your nature. Why? Because our nature determines our actions determines our walk the heart determines our direction uh, if you're a son of the darkness you've got a vile heart under the control of the devil and therefore it's his children that you are uh, give you another example James and John were called the sons of thunder you remember that 
<laughs> okay, that, that shows you why. Because of their boldness and their wanting to burn up a bunch of Samaritans. Uh, Barnabas, over in the book of Acts, was called the son of consolation. Remember how he encouraged everybody? Remember when everybody's wanting to kill Paul after Paul even had become a Christian? And Paul shows up and says, guys, I've joined you all. And they're all saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> there's no. There's no way. This guy was having us put to death. We remember when you stoned Stephen, and now you're just trying to infiltrate us. And Barnabas was the one who came in and smoothed all that over because that's the kind of man he was. You know, he was able to say, no, 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 no. He's really, truly a, a, a convert. So whatever it is uh, that dominates your life, you're a son of. You could be a son of love, a son of kindness. You could be a son or daughter of anger and wrath, uh, of sin. But here we're called sons of light. We are destined for heaven's glorious light. You know, when you get to heaven, there's not going to be the new heaven, the new earth. There's no sun or moon. God is the light. There's no night there. Do you know that? There'll never be darkness in heaven. Wonder if he'll give us sunglasses to take our naps. <laughs> no, our whole experience will be rest. You know, it's all going to be rest. We won't need rest like we need it now. No, we don't need rest right now. So, uh, I, but anyway, uh, but we're headed toward God's eternal light. That's just our nature. We're the children of light, and we live forever in the kingdom. Look at Colossians again. Go to Colossians chapter one. Verse 13, for he has delivered us. My version says rescued, the same word for rapture. <laughs> he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us where? The kingdom of his dear son. Of his dear son. There you go. That's where we are now. That's not something yet future. Paul said it was happening right then. So we're the children of light. We live in a different sphere. Sin, Romans 6 says, has no dominion over you. Do you know that? No dominion over you. No authority over you anymore. Can't separate you from God. Why? Because as you sin, his blood continually what? Cleanses you and takes it away. We're partakers of the light in Christ and he lives in us. And we shine as that light in the world. Um, the day of the Lord has nothing to do with us we're not we died to that old kingdom we no longer are slaves we've been set free and we're new creatures and we, and we died in christ and our life is hidden so we are the people of the light so don't fear the day of the lord don't fear the day of the lord and the first reason is our nature and i'm just going to briefly introduce our second uh, one, but I'll not develop, I won't unpack it. The second feature is the distinction of our behavior. That's a testimony. We've got a new nature, so the new nature governs then our behavior. The distinction of what now? Of our behavior. Okay. Our actions always follow your heart. It's not the other way around. And I, I, you know, that's, that's, I use that in counseling a whole lot because we, the people in the darkness get it backwards, okay? We, we, we put feeling before, uh, uh, I mean, we put, uh, we let our feelings dictate what we do. And, you know, it's like with Cain. Take Cain, for example. He, he's the best example in the Bible. When it needs to be the doing of what's in our heart that impacts our feelings. Cain became depressed and despondent. You remember that? Angry. Because what Cain was doing was his letting his circumstances control his behavior. God told him, he said, listen, do well and everything will be all right. Do well. Now, a person who's in darkness can't do well. 
because their heart's in bondage to sin. But can we do well? So then we need to let our hearts dictate our behavior. So let us not sleep. Walk in the light. Because he is in the light. So he gives us the commands that we are to, to, to follow. We are the day people. And uh, we're supposed to behave properly. But we'll get into that second one more next Monday. Any questions or comments before I go to God in prayer? A lot to digest. But it's pretty simple. Right? So ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done, for the goodness of your word. So thankful are we that the light has been shown within our hearts to have the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this is from your hand, by your marvelous and wonderful grace. We are so thankful, and we know that we fear not the day of the Lord, for that's not ours. And we look and hasten unto you so that we can be caught up to be with Jesus forever. Thank you for these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Turn that off, sorry.